Now that the first three episodes of The Rings of Power Season 2 have been out for some days, I think it's a good time to record a little critique of those episodes and share my thoughts, what I think about them in a bit more detail than I did in my first impressions video. What I can say is that in my opinion the show definitely improved, but of course a few things are still not 100% there and this is what we will look at in this video. My name is Chris aka The Philosopher's Games and before we start a small spoiler warning of course for the first three episodes of season two, but let us start. One thing that at least seems better to me for now is the pacing of the show and they don't feel that busy. Still busy, especially if you have to introduce everything at the beginning, but no comparison to how busy some episodes in season one were in comparison. Just think of episode one where they already introduced all character arcs for the most part and also had this prologue that introduced into the second age. They then at some point, at least in most episodes, limited the amount of character story arcs they show per episode to three and they continue doing this in season two it seems. But still they had a lot of problems in season one with the pacing because sometimes they just had to tell so many things in one episode just that in episode six at least two of the big plot lines can come together. And this made it feel like they were constantly in a rush. And they accomplished this with this not very organic writing style. They were just so busy moving characters around all the time to be at the right place so that at some point there was a specific scene they had in mind and this had to just work and everything had to be bent towards it. But it never felt very organic or natural from the development of the characters, from their movement, from how simply the plot developed. And that was a big problem. Plus also they added this mystery box component all the time to maybe make also the book readers kind of guess. But that is stupid in my opinion because I know the books, I don't need to be surprised. Just show me what I know. They revealed who Sauron is, a big mystery in episode eight and people who know the books and looked into the show quite a bit, like we called it before the show was even out when some of the trailers were there. There was only one factor of uncertainty which was a stranger, but it was a 50-50 between those and we know they need Sauron for the show. They don't need Gandalf or an Istar for the show, but I guess that is what they are going for. Still, it's not interesting and it is not storytelling to keep the audience guess for 11 episodes who this guy might be. It could be Gandalf, but it could also be a blue with it. Here are some hints, like, are you kidding us? You can do this for some episodes for sure, but not for 11 episodes. Just you waste our time. Just tell us who he is and use this character to its full extent. And here we are in the middle of the discussion, what are the problems of season two? It is not 10 out of 10 must watch now. It is just a little bit better than it was before in my opinion. And there is room for improvement still quite a bit, but there's also a lot of potential in my opinion. Also, we book fans have to kind of get over what we know from the books because this show is unfortunately very fan fiction heavy. So when I watch season two, I just leave everything season one did behind. I have to accept that season two is built on this foundation that is season one for it. And I don't like that. But if they at least now manage to tell the story somewhat cohesively and slowly return to what Tolkien actually wrote, though I know there will be changes due to the massive time compression, then I can kind of live with that, but I know not all book fans can. I think the positive thing is that watching the first three episodes of season one, I look forward to episode four. And I think that is like basically half time already after episode four. So it's a very important one. Here they really have to catch us and convince us that what all this leads to is worth our time. We already talked about the stranger plotline. And like I said, it has a very big problem. Like I personally enjoy the chemistry between the actors. I really like this. I also like that it's more lighthearted so far at least with um, of course also some dramatic elements here and there, but it's a nice counterweight to all the depressing stuff that happens in the other plot lines. 
But if you don't like the Harfoots and the stranger interacting and so on, it's a completely boring and uninteresting plotline for you because nothing happens there. And their goal is so abstract, finding some stars that you can't really connect it to the main plot of Rings of Power. As a result, it's simply not that interesting. It needs more. All it has going is that we guess who is this character, this mystery box. In season one, at least for some time, we had at least the speculation, is it Sauron or is it one of the Istari? That was one possible guess for who it is. And now that Sauron is out, we now have only five Istari left who this guy could be. And if you think about it, it's actually just four options because blue with it can be counted as one. And also most people who are not very deep into the books don't know anything about the blue with it. There's no connection to this for this to have a payoff. So it must be one of the Istari that people know, which is Saruman, Gandalf and Radagast. And he does not look like Saruman, the man of skill. And he also is not that close to nature, in my opinion, that he could be a Radagast. So Gandalf is basically left. The last option would be they make something up, but here we also would have no payoff. Maybe this guy is Gandalf. Oh no, it's this completely random character we just made up and you have no connection to. And we just kept you guessing for two seasons. Like, that is no payoff. For the payoff, it needs to be Gandalf or maybe, I don't know, Saruman in a weird scenario. Beyond that, it is part of the plot that they are wandering around and he can't control his powers. And guess what? They continue doing this in season two as well. That does not really help to make the plot more interesting. We are basically doing the same as we did big parts of season one until he found the staff and then he had his moment. And you think, yeah, he has this moment. He can now control his powers. No, he can't. Back to the drawing board. We are right back to the start and do the same thing again. I just hope they won't continue this for the whole season and just reveal who he truly is at the very end. At least I hope he can control his power soon and finds his teacher who teaches him or whatever they want to do. And then things might become better and interesting. It's just mind boggling though that they start this plotline again with setup. Like you had a whole season for the setup and just continue. There was no development. It is mind boggling. And the only reason why I'm not completely negative is that I like the actors so much and I like their interaction. It's just fun to watch for me. That's all that saves this plot line. So I hope they give the actors a raise. Let us now talk about some of the stronger parts, which is the main plot line that leads to the creation of the Rings of Power. Here I also have a lot of things to criticize, surprise. And for example, Galadriel is just such a weirdly written character that makes at many places absolutely no sense that I feel so sorry for this very talented actress to portray such a poorly written script. Galadriel is introduced as Sauron's arch enemy. She's the only one who believes that he's still out there and that he is a threat. And she searches for him and she wants to revenge her brother. Though of course Gilgalad and Elrond warn her that by searching Sauron she might activate him. Though in my opinion that is not a very good take because the evil never sleeps in Tolkien's universe. It's just part of the world. That is how Tolkien set up his world. So the belief is very naive, which I also find not fitting to their characters. So for season two, for this to work and for Sauron coming back to Eregion and trying to influence Kilibrimbor, the only way this can work is when Galadriel does not tell anybody who Halbrand really was. And this whole foundation on which season two will be built hangs at this little rope that is as thick as a hair established at the end of season one where Galadriel doesn't tell the people. And it seems to me completely out of character. I can't believe that she would do this. It makes no sense. The only reason why she does it is it's written in the screenplay. She could go to her king Gilgalad and tell him you were wrong. Sauron is back. We have to be prepared. Prepare yourself. But no, that's not what she does. She has to be convinced to tell Gilgalad. And that makes so little sense in my opinion. But let's pretend it would make sense. Then she at least told Celebrimbor to never treat with Halbrand again. 
Why would she say this to Celebrimbor? Because he could be an enemy, maybe the enemy himself or at least a spy of the enemy. And this Celebrimbor could have easily guessed. I mean he's one of the smartest, most talented elves of the second age. But because it is written in the screenplay, he lets him in. And it seems, even though it's cool and I understand what they are going for, it's too easy for Halbrand to get into Eregion and also talk to Celebrimbor. It just is too easy, it feels a bit unplausible. However, once this little detail is overcome, I think this part is really strong and Charlie Vickers is really such a talented actor and plays this so well in my opinion. Also of course the actor of Celebrimbor. And like another detail why this all works is that a letter where Gilgalad warns Eregion of Sauron does not reach Celebrimbor. The reason is that messengers get killed on their way and this feels so cheap again simply because we're talking about Sauron, the most evil powerful entity in Middle-earth that could threaten the existence of not only the elves but of all three peoples of Middle-earth and they just sent two messengers to warn them that Sauron is there. Why not go there themselves which, which like a huge escort to go there maybe to even catch Sauron there on the spot. Like I, I don't understand this. It makes no sense. It's a very noticeable problem in the show that the writers write their characters like they're absolutely brain dead. Another problem is a bit how Sauron is written because if you think from season one to um, the first three episodes of season two, a lot of accidents happen that are kind of very convenient for Sauron and work out. Galadriel could have told Celebrimbor on the spot that Halbrand was Sauron and that is why he should never treat with him again and don't let him in at all. And this would have also worked. But by going back to Eregion, Halbrand now takes a huge risk that this was not exposed. Conveniently, the message that warns Eregion also does not reach it. As a result, this also works in Sauron's way. And now what the writers can do is decide, well, this was an accident and press the accident button or this was Sauron's master plan all along and press that button. But that's not good writing. Another problem with Sauron is that I think what the show wants to reference here is his use of what Tolkien called Osanwe, that is basically telepathic abilities of elves but also used by the spirit beings, the Ainur, like Sauron. And what is important in Osanwe is that the other one has an open mind. And we can hear Celebrimbor say, I have an open heart for your problems, please tell them to me. And Sauron could use this technique to reinforce what he is saying and reinforce his manipulation, so to say. But the show never explains this to the viewer. And of course, I can tell you about this, but it should be in the show. Still, I enjoyed this section quite a bit because the actors carry it so hard and further, it's also, if you just look at this section, like it is in the book. The setup to this point and the order and other things are completely different in the book. But the story, like this little section, like Anatar comes to Eregion, nobody knows who he is and he convinces Celebrimbor and teaches him to forge rings of power. And then they start learning this process First the lesser rings, then the 16 rings of power, then Anatar leaves Eregion and then Celebrimbor in secret does the three rings of power on his own with some changes to the design in secret without Anatar. And that is basically the story that is portrayed here. You see it's a bit different but at least this section Anatar teaches Celebrimbor and pretends that he's an ambassador of the West. This is also in the books and they even have the name Anatar which does not appear in the Lord of the Rings so they seem to have gotten rights to use that name and that's pretty awesome in my opinion. Still they made it very complicated for themselves to kind of get to this point. If they just stick to what Tolkien wrote it would have been easier. Of course some changes they had to make like spread the rings out early which in the Lord of the Rings does not happen at all like Galadriel, Gilgalad and Círdan get their three rings when the one ring is already forged much much later and they warned them all along and so on. 
dare to change this here, else they would have needed to establish so many fictional new characters, elves in the region to get those rings, because in the books, these 19 rings were forged for the elves in the region, not for anybody outside. They also compress this part and then forge the rings directly for the dwarves and for men. So that is also different in the book. Most dwarves and especially men getting those rings of power happens much, much later after this complete plotline. Then if we come to Lindon, I found a bit strange that how it was decided who gets what ring. Because in Tolkien's world, they would usually just sit together like the wisest of the elves come together in Lindon and then have a council and discuss the pros and cons of the rings and then make a decision. That sounds maybe a bit boring and the outcome potentially would have been the same anyway, but here Eron jumps off a cliff and then talks to Círdan and then back and forth and so on. As a result, the elves don't feel very elf-like in my opinion. That's not so great, I think, because especially Gilgalad is known as a very wise king in the books and here not so much. Also, I really like Círdan, how they depict him, the actor and so on. He also seems very wise, makes some good points here and there. And um, that is what he is for. He's just one of the oldest and wisest elves. And he's one of my um, favorite side characters of the elves. Also, the elves have like a huge lack of consequences for their actions. I mean, even though I totally understand Elrond here, he disobeyed the direct orders of the High King of the Elves. And then, I don't know, yeah, Elrond, um, he has this very important mission. You are in charge now. Um, good luck, have fun. No consequences for you whatsoever. And we just pretend nothing ever happened. We are just four people in the region anyway. So who am I supposed to send? I mean, of course, they could have cleared or resolved this issue in the background, but... They should have shown this in the show, because otherwise Gilgalad seems like a complete idiot that has no authority or power, and his subordinates do whatever they want without consequences. Then we have the Southlands. Not much to say here, to be honest. We have to see how the plot develops due to the actress um, of Bronwyn stopping her acting career and not being available for the show anymore. They deleted her character. And now basically what they had to do is reset the relationship with Arondir and Theo. It's basically back where it was at the beginning. Nothing has happened in season one for this plot, which is very unfortunate. But now we have Isildur here and he meets um, Estrid, potential love interest, also with an interesting twist there. We will see how this develops. We have to give it some more time. How interesting this now will be, hard to tell and how they will connect it to the greater plot also hard to tell. Then we have Numinor and my worry is a bit that this plotline might be a bit too big for season two and I hope they just do some setup for season three then but still things are also starting there and they definitely need a good focus on Eregion and the events there in my opinion. Then we have the coronation scene. I feel very sorry for Miriel because she has to endure so much and I also really like the actress and how she portrays the character but nothing works really out for her and it feels like it's not her fault it's just because it's written in the screenplay. Then it is said when to your coronation an eagle would appear it would be considered a good omen and then an eagle appears to her coronation and then Farazon claims no he's here for me not for this event we all gathered here for because he knows I'm actually here. I mean, of course, Manwe can see everything, but that's not established in the show. Manwe is the king of the world, the highest authority just below Eru, and that is God. He is the king of the Valar, and the great eagles are his messengers. But like I said, the show does not explain that. And if you say, well, that is common knowledge in the lore, it is also common knowledge that the eagles can actually talk, especially if they are sent as messengers and they do this in the Lord of the Rings book. Peter Jackson did never go for this and I assume the show also don't want to go for this. But in theory, the eagle could have easily resolved the situation by just saying something. As a result, with all this knowledge and all the stuff that the show does not tell us, it feels like a very forced situation that only happens because it is written like this 
in the screenplay and the showrunners had this vision of this scene or whatever. Then we have the dwarven section which was a highlight in season one for me and it still is. I want to say in general that in this show in season two suddenly places feel a bit more alive because you have more people standing in the background also some minor characters here and there that also say something at times so places don't feel that empty and this kind of helps in my opinion but Casa Duma was always uh, pretty great in this regard and now we have this cool marketplace scene and so on so as a result we kind of learn a bit how the society might work you can criticize this a bit as well if you look um, a bit deeper into it and say is there no redundancy um, for such an important um, device like these shafts for the light and so on but uh, still okay it's now um, the setup for the plot line in Casa Doom there's the earthquake we had a volcano breakout okay this kind of influences their mountain to some degree and suddenly um, they uh, struggle a bit with life there and then this pushes or connects this storyline to that of Iregion to some degree that's very um, interesting and worked for the most part for me quite well though as I said if you look deeper into it you could also criticize a few writing decisions here and there as well like King Durin basically told the elves, screw you guys, you won't get any Mithril. And as soon as his kingdom is now struggling, and I can understand his decision there, don't get me wrong. He says, here, as for Mithril, give me some rings. It is a bit strange in my opinion, especially when his son says, I don't trust these guys. I feel like this they should have elaborated a bit further instead of just cut and here's King Durin how he gives Mithril to Anatar and Kilibrimbor. That I find a bit strange. I know this was now a lot of criticizing, nitpicking and so on, but the show still has some places where the writers need to work on and to improve. I hope they manage to do this over the season and it gets better. I really hope that and I just hope we can at the end leave season one behind and never talk about it again. Just say, yeah, well, look, watch a summary. I have one on my channel and then um, start with season two. It's better. I hope that will be the case. Also, what I want to positively say is, like I said, places feel more alive. Pacing got much, much better. Music is awesome. Also, the costumes are so great. The performance of the actors, like there was not a single actor where I say, um, he didn't work out for me. I feel like it's sometimes impressive how much these actors can get out of a script written so poorly at times. Also, the horse actor was absolutely phenomenal in episode 3, I have to say that. And further, the cinematography is great. The visual effects, I think they improved a little bit further in this show. So that is awesome. There are many cool details in the show. We looked at the maps. We see the map with Erendil at the wall. Isildur has also a map with um, which you can decipher and read some interesting notes on it. Like um, beware of the wild men or something like that. It is absolutely fantastic. If you look into these details, there's a lot of people put work in and had also love for detail. I appreciate that a lot. It is there. Unfortunately, I think the biggest problem of the show in season one was the writing and maybe also some of the COVID restrictions. You definitely suffered from this as well, for sure. I think this will get better in season two. I also think it will get better because they have now a clear course, at least in the main storyline, they can work towards too. And... Not, not not everything is so vague with some exceptions of course and as soon as also some of the other plot lines get going I think it could become a very decent season I just hope they continue improving instead of going a step back I felt like episode 3 was already even though it was in, it had its moments that were very strong it felt like at some places it was a step back again and I hope episode 4 will be a step forward Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, press the like button, leave a comment, tell me what you thought of the first three episodes and maybe subscribe if you want to get notified if there is more Lord of the Rings related or Rings of Power related content here on this channel. Further, I will do a watch party later where we watch episode one, two and three 
and then tomorrow we will look into episode four. We'll give you a first impressions video or something that is at least the plan, then analysis stream like we did the past few times, and then give me some time to produce content. Will be easier this time. Like three covering three episodes is really, really hard, but there will be content. Again, thank you for watching and see you people next time. Goodbye.